reach across time and see yourself. You stand tall against terrifying enemies. You build masterpieces and break down barriers. You rush into the future and meet your past. For every time, at every moment, the official network of every millennium. The History Channel, where the past comes alive. Coming up, 38 eyewitnesses to a young woman's murder, and not one did anything to help. In 1964, a young woman named Kitty Genovese was brutally stabbed to death on the streets of New York City as dozens of people watched from the safety of their homes. There is a kind of evil in the silence. It's almost as if the bystanders are knowing accomplices of the criminal. Her name has been associated with a single chilling phrase, I didn't want to get involved. There were two questions. How did it happen? And the second question was, what would I have done? How did it happen that a young woman screamed for help as 38 people watched and heard and did nothing? The murder of this young woman shocked the nation and triggered an agonized public debate about whether she was killed by a single attacker or by the indifference of dozens of eyewitnesses. Join us for Silent Witnesses, the Kitty Genovese murder. New York City in March 1964, a young family man at home intently studies the ants through the glass of his ant farm. He watches as they devour live cockroaches. Late night television flickers black and white. His two children are asleep. His wife, a nurse, works the night shift. It is past midnight and the man is consumed by a single obsession. He was everything a good husband and a good son and good citizen should be, except that he happened to be a vicious murderer. The man gets into his 1960 white Corvair and cruises the empty streets, hunting for a young woman to kill. Hungry for prey, he drives for more than an hour. Then a young woman drives by, perfectly alone, a perfectly random victim. The stranger follows her car to the tree-lined middle-class neighborhood of Kew Gardens in the borough of Queens. She parks in the lot next to the railroad station, which is just steps away from the rear entrance to her walk-up apartment. She senses a presence in the shadows. She begins to run up the sidewalk in front of the shops towards a police call box at the corner. He chases her and grabs his prey. Her name is Kitty Genovese. He had a hunting knife, which he simply took and plunged it into her back, and she let out a scream. Ah! Oh my God, he stabbed me! Kitty screamed, oh my God, I've been stabbed. Help me, somebody help me. There was one man who opened his window and shouted down, leave her alone. The attacker looks up, interrupting his assault, and runs back to his car, leaving Kitty wounded. Kitty Genovese didn't stagger, but walked, some said, almost in a dreamlike way around to the back of her block. reaches the first unlocked door at 8262 Austin Street, just three doors from her own entryway. She collapses at the bottom of the stairs. Again, she screams. Her attacker goes back to his Corvair, backs it up quickly, and parks on a side street. There, the man takes the time to change from his stocking cap to a fedora that shadows his face. He waits 10 minutes and then goes back to find her. Like a wolf on the trail of his prey, he began to seek out Kitty. He looked first in the railroad station, sniffing here, sniffing there. I 
think even now of the terror that, that Kitty Genovese must have felt because she was certainly conscious and she thought at least she had gotten away from this would-be killer and suddenly the door opens and there he is. And he pounced down on her. Kitty Genovese screams loud enough to wake up the sleeping neighbors, but there are no good Samaritans that come to her aid. She fights the knife thrusts with her bare hands. He slit her throat, stabbed her several times, raped her. The entire attack lasts 30 minutes. When he's finished, he goes up the walkway, around the block, and saunters down Austin Street. When he got home, he washed his knife, went to sleep. For all we know, he slept the sleep of the just. The attacker leaves behind no evidence, only his victim barely breathing. Finally, an anonymous call is made to the police who arrive on the scene within two minutes. It is 3.50 a.m. A neighbor, too late, cradles the mutilated body of Kitty Genovese in her arms. The 28-year-old woman bleeds to death in the ambulance on the way to Queens General Hospital. Detectives canvass the neighborhood and begin to reconstruct with growing horror the last minutes of Kitty Genovese's life. They learn she was the popular manager at Ev's 11th Hour Tavern, and later that morning, detectives interrogate some of her co-workers. She had a, a date with this fella that I knew. Oh, I guess it was close to 3 o'clock in the morning. She came in and said that uh, she was going to go home. So I said to her, I thought you were going to stay with Bessie upstairs. Uh, she says I was going to, but I think I'll go home. At 6 a.m., the New Canaan police receive a call that a Catherine Genovese, the daughter of a local family, has been savagely murdered. Her brother, William Genovese, is 16 when they get the knock on the door. My mother had gone to the door and it was like, I was sort of half asleep and I heard a shriek. And it was something to the effect that, you know, I believe this is correct, that your, your daughter, you have a daughter, Catherine, that, uh, yeah, she was uh, hurt in the city, or you know, she was injured. And he was trying to delay the, the finality of the thing, like, oh, yes, this happened, and she was attacked. But he, he couldn't get it out, and then finally said, you know, that, you know, we believe this is your daughter, and we believe she's dead, and she was murdered, you know. A day later, the New York Times runs a routine item buried on the back pages. The headline reads, Queen's Woman Stabbed to Death in Front of Home. It is printed in the small type used for murders of minor importance. There is no mention of the void left by her death. She was a living, breathing person who is very important to us, you know. The overwhelming feel I get is there weren't enough memories. We would look each other eyeball to eyeball and we would talk about the most profound things. She was the provocateur of conversation in the family. She was the leader. For me, the family lost its leader. I lost my mother, my intellectual mother. I lost my best friend. An uncle goes to identify Kitty's body before it is released for burial. The murderer is still at large. I started hitchhiking to New York to do what? <laughs> I mean, I just found myself like I was going to go there and find him and get him. You know, I mean, what was that all about? But, you know, it was like, what else do you do? I mean, you, you don't know what to do. In the family photo albums, pictures of Kitty abruptly stop on her 28th birthday. But she exists in memory as the swaggering tomboy, the spitfire, the spirited oldest sister who taught her younger brother about life and death. The morning after the murder, Kitty Genovese's killer goes to work as though nothing has happened. Initially, there are no leads in the investigation. Then, after five days, there is a small break in the case. Detectives find a milkman who was making deliveries in the early morning hours the day Kitty was murdered. He remembers seeing a young man casually leaving the scene and provides a good description of the killer. There is still no suspect, no motive, no murder weapon. And because of the predatory nature of the crime, the police profile of the killer suggests he might strike again, a prediction that comes true. Six days after the murder, the killer leaves his home intent on committing another crime. 
He did a daylight burglary of an apartment in Queens, broke into an apartment, and took out a television set, which he put in his car. And a neighbor, in this case, happened to notice what was happening. And the neighbor said, who are you? The burglar answers, smiling, it's okay, I'm just giving them a hand moving, and returns to the apartment to retrieve his screwdriver. Meanwhile, the neighbor called a friend of his and said, you think the people next door are moving? And the neighbor said, no, I know they're not moving. The two men pull out the distributor cap to disable the ignition of the burglar's car. They call the police as they watch the burglar from the window. Unable to start his car, he calmly walks away, whistling. He's picked up by the police a few blocks away. He is cooperative. His name is Winston Mosley, and he has no prior record. What struck me as it struck the detectives who were interrogating Mosley was a almost supernatural gentleness to him. He is soft-spoken, well-mannered, and articulate. Mosley appears to be a small-time thief, yet his profile doesn't add up. Married, two kids, owns a home in a nice neighborhood, good-paying job in an electronics company. Mosley quickly confesses to a string of 40 burglaries over the past year. But he is too cool. NYPD Captain Albert Seedman senses that there is more and pushes harder. After four hours, Winston Mosley quietly confesses to several violent rapes. Then the detective asks Mosley about the scratches on his hand. He shows no remorse, no agitation, only the hint of a smile, and then Winston Mosley whispers shyly, okay, I killed her. He never once raised his voice, never once showed any sensitivity or any awareness or realization. This is a horrible thing to do. According to his own testimony, Winston Mosley just said, I decided I would go out and see if I could find a girl to kill. Mosley retraces his moves the night of the murder. Then he recalls the lights coming on in some apartments and a man shouting down. And when the detectives asked him, weren't you afraid that the police would come? Mosley just smiled and said, oh no, I, know, I knew nobody would do anything. On March 19th, Mosley is charged with first degree murder for the killing of Catherine Genovese. He murdered not out of any overt anger, not out of any wish to rob. Something else motivated him, and what that something is, is very difficult to know. It's very, very dark in the soul of Winston Mosley. Sidney Sparrow, a respected New York attorney living in Queens, is appointed by the New York Supreme Court to defend Winston Mosley. I was assigned by Judge Shapiro to represent this man about whom all the people were agog. Everybody was looking, everybody saw, and there I was getting a new case which but to all intents and purposes was going to be noisy and exciting. With a client who had already confessed, Sparrow must not only prepare a defense strategy, but he must also carefully assess his client's personality. What kind of man is Winston Mosley? I had spoken to the people in the prison, and when they brought him out, it didn't seem like this could be a creature that could have done any of the things that I had learned by the scuttlebutt around the courthouse. I would have thought that he was the most innocent person in the room, but he wasn't. There was a devil in him somewhere. Sidney Sparrow carefully observes Winston Mosley's demeanor in their first jailhouse meeting. I wanted to know, did you kill this girl? He said, yes, I killed her. His voice was slow low, quiet, and he acknowledged without the slightest trace of concern or alarm or anything. He took it as a matter of course. When he described the situation as being like a six flies on a wall, and you take a swatter, you hit them, five get away, the one you got. There is absolutely no question in Sparrow's mind. The only defense is to enter a plea of insanity. He was uh, very nondescript and he was placid. He showed no hint or in indication that he was aware of the fact that what he was being charged with might very well lead to his being fried in the electric chip. To save Winston Mosley from the death penalty, 
Sidney Sparrow must persuade a jury that his client is incapable of discerning right from wrong. Every single thing that he did was aimed at a sexual horror. He wanted to actually destroy the vaginal canal, wanted to destroy the breast nipples. It was man against woman as far as he is concerned, and woman was nothing more than one of the flies on the wall. These are things that were beyond the pale, that there was no end to the depredations that this man was going to subject this woman to. Sparrow enters the darkest corners of his client's psyche. His childhood was, it had a bearing, I think, on what happened. And that was because his mom had had operations involving the genitalia, surgery that had penetrated her body. Winston was distressed and disturbed over that. And ultimately, when he attacked Kitty, he did to her the horrible things that he envisioned his mother had gone through. Ten days after the murder, New York Police Commissioner Michael J. Murphy and A.M. Rosenthal, the new Metropolitan Editor of the New York Times, are having a casual lunch. I first uh, heard about the story of Catherine Genovese uh, from the Police Commissioner of New York, with whom I was having lunch in a restaurant near City Hall called Emil's. Murphy hoped to encourage Rosenthal to follow up on the story. Then he offers a shocking detail about the Queen's murder. Murphy says, Brother, that's one for the books. 38 people watched a woman being killed, and not one of them called the police to save her life. My immediate judgment was, this is astonishing. And what it showed about New York, I didn't know. I wanted to find out. But the first thing to do as a journalist is to find out what the story is. March 23, 1964. The nation still grieves the assassination of President Kennedy. Social unrest simmers, and the Vietnam War escalates. Against this backdrop of a turbulent America, the rumor of a large number of silent witnesses preoccupies A.M. Rosenthal, the metropolitan editor for the New York Times. Here was a story about a woman being killed in the middle of the night, and people who might have helped her did not. And I thought that was very interesting. Police reports confirm that 38 law-abiding citizens did watch an atrocity unfold, but did nothing to save the victim's life. On March 27th, this becomes a front-page story in New York City, and then around the world. Very few stories transfer immediately their essential meaning from the victim or the participant to the reader. This did. There were two questions. How did it happen? And the second question was, what would I have done? The New York Times article shocks the city with its story about 38 people who turned their backs on a neighbor. The article tries to explain what really happened in the cold early morning darkness in a pleasant neighborhood in Queens. Those screams resonated amongst the buildings there. In the quiet of the night, neighbors awoke, went to their windows. This happened under a street lamp. You could say it was almost a stage-like scene. Neighbors in a seven-story building have window views of the street, and 16 second-story apartments provide front-row seating for the attack. The neighbors peek through curtains. Some move from window to window as though from scene to scene. Others say they pulled up chairs to better witness the crime. 38 people admit they watched. The police suspect many more haven't come forward. Detectives provide details to prosecuting attorney Charles Scholar, a resident of Queens at the time of the murder. It was not a very happy feeling to know that my fellow residents couldn't take a few moments to pick up a telephone and call the police when one of the neighbors was in dire distress and need for assistance. The elevator operator across the street has what can best be described as the box seat. There was a large bay window, and he could see without obstruction the entire attack take place. Instead of taking some action, the night elevator operator got out of his chair, went downstairs, and went to sleep. Witnesses watch spellbound for more than 30 minutes as a killer stalks and stabs Kitty Genovese. The two most disturbing witnesses of all the neighbors 
was the elevator operator in the Mowbray across the street and the man in whose hallway Kitty was attacked for the second time. I don't think I could feel more disgust for individuals than those two people. There was, in the midst of this final attack, the door opening upstairs, where the neighbor looked down, someone who knew Kitty Genovese well, and he did nothing. And that was her end. Later, the police learned that neighbors called each other to ask what to do, but no one called the police in time to save Kitty Genovese. When police finally arrive on the scene, detectives are baffled, disgusted, angry. What's the matter with these people? You're fearful to make a phone call from your own apartment? When the New York Times article is printed on March 27th, some answers appear in print. There are many reasons, but the most chilling quote comes from a man who simply says, I didn't want to get involved. Oh, I thought it was a lover's quote. I didn't know what to do. I didn't want to get involved. I was afraid. I didn't exactly know what was going on anyway. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do. I didn't want to get involved. I was afraid. The witnesses say they didn't want to fill out forms or go to court. It would be inconvenient. It was their legal right, they say, not to get involved. The public is horrified. It's very easy for people who hear about the Genovese incident to think of the 38 witnesses apathetic as different from themselves. But the sad fact is that the 38 witnesses are probably typical of us. The 38 witnesses are not them, they're us began to tell us something that we never knew the story would. It began to tell us about ourselves. Or it was the beginning of what we later became the heart of this story. Nobody really, and it's a terrible thing to say, and I, I don't say it proudly, right? journalism did not inquire very deeply into the life of Catherine Genovese. It inquired into her death. And that was why she became, her name became a household word. Not how she lived, but how she died. The March 27th Times article ends with a quote from a police officer who says that when the ambulance drove off with Kitty's body, then the people came out. As the story of Kitty Genovese unfolds, A.M. Rosenthal begins his own assessment of what happened and eventually turns it into a book titled 38 Witnesses. I began asking some of the questions. Would I do such a thing? Never. And then as I was writing the book, I realized that was not the question, but the question was, would I do it again? At the time of the murder, Rosenthal has just returned to New York after years abroad as a foreign correspondent. For more than a decade, he lived in the most impoverished corners of the world, in Pakistan, Afghanistan, and India. I saw people dying on the streets, dying of hunger or of disease. I didn't stop to find out what they were dying of. These people's horror of living and dying uh, kind of disgusted me. I didn't realize it was disgusted, but they were dirty. It was smelly, so I walked on. So I had done basically what these 38 silent wit witnesses I was writing about had done, and I had done it many times. Walked by people whom I could have helped on the spot. Kitty's brother William also broods about the 38 witnesses. From my point of view, you would think I'd be like horrified at these 38 people, but I was really kind of identifying with them and wondering at age 16, well, what if I was up there? What, what would I have done? I don't know. What's it like to live in New York City in 1964, March 13, 3 o'clock in the morning? What was it like? I mean, what would I have done? With the trial of Mosley imminent, the Genovese family is silent. The family was sickened by the notoriety. It's like, oh God, besieged with phone calls about this and that. What do you think? It's like, is any of this going to bring her back? Doesn't matter to me. I mean, let justice be done. I'm sure it will be, you know. But what's going to turn this around? What's going to answer the questions? June 8th, 1964. The Genovese murder trial is in session. Hundreds of onlookers crowd the courtroom. Thousands more wait on the steps of the Queens County Courthouse. Judge Irwin Shapiro presides. Sidney Sparrow leads the defense team. When Winston Mosley pleads not guilty by reason of insanity, the courtroom onlookers cheer. 
the prosecution and the public want a clean conviction. Murder in the first degree, and then the electric chair. You must remember that as prosecutors, uh, our main function was to try and present an intelligent case and establish the guilt of a defendant beyond a reasonable doubt. Assistant DA Charles Scholler is part of the team prosecuting Mosley. The prosecution does not want the conduct of the witnesses to detract from the acts of Winston Mosley. We were not looking into the psychology of why the neighbors did not take action or do something to help Kitty. There have been newspaper accounts, anecdotal stories, and rumors about the murder. Now, the legal system will present the definitive account of what happened on March 13th. Kitty parked her car in this lot, got out of the car, saw the defendant get out of his car where it was parked at the bus stop. She was frightened. It was a dark, lonely night, nobody on the streets. She started to run up Austin Street. And she got as far as the street light when Winston Mosley caught up to her and stabbed her four times in the back. At that moment, one of the neighbors on the seventh floor, hearing Kitty screams, looked out the window and yelled, what's going on down there? And it startled and frightened Winston Mosley, and he ran away. He ran back down Austin Street to his car, got in his car, backed it up to 82nd Road, and parked it. The prosecution emphasizes to the jury that Winston Mosley runs away. Runs away, they say, because he knows exactly what he's doing, committing a murder. And hats, the prosecution hammers home, are a crucial point in their case against Mosley's plea of insanity. Proof that Winston Mosley knows that what he is doing is wrong. Kitty staggers around the corner from Austin Street, up this block, and continues to stagger, looking for a door. The door of the coffee shop here was locked, but she's still in view of the neighbor on the sixth floor. She continues staggering until she reaches the first open door at 8262 Austin Street, and she collapsed inside this hallway. And this is where she was when Winston Mosley found her the second time and stabbed her a number of times including her throat in order to silence her. The courtroom is quiet as the crowd absorbs the fatal consequences of what Mosley did and the neighbors silence. Seven of Kitty's neighbors are called to testify. They reveal that Winston Mosley is so intent on rape and murder that he continues his attack even when he is clearly aware that he is being watched. You have to think about how brazen this man was and yet how well, he had calibrated his knowledge of how the neighbors would react. While he was finishing off Kitty Genovese in the stairwell of her building, the upstairs neighbor opened his door, looked down, saw that a murder was taking place, and what did he do? Shut his door. Now, he denied that, but Winston Mosley said, oh, I can identify the guy. There is no effort on the part of the defense to deny the commission of crimes by Winston Mosley. He takes the witness stand himself and readily admits to the murder in graphic detail. At issue is his sanity. Did Winston Mosley know what he was doing? Did he know it was wrong? The prosecution's closing argument goes right to the heart of Mosley's cool, premeditated plan. In this case, the details clearly established that Winston Mosley knew the nature and quality of his act. He knew that what he was doing was killing a human being. And it was clear that he knew it was wrong by his conduct in changing the hat, in leaving the scene, and then in coming back to finish her off. He knew that he was going to kill her, and he knew that if he got caught, he would be punished. And that clearly goes to knowing that it's wrong. The prosecution rests. The jurors were pretty certain of what they were going to do all along. I sensed the horror and the ominous aspects of the audience every 
every day. The jury briefly deliberates. Winston Mosley is convicted of murder in the first degree. The enormous yell of approval that emanated from the uh, people in there. There were hundreds in the courtroom and there were thousands outside apparently. Mosley was the same cool, cold potato at that point. After a brief hearing, Judge Shapiro, a known opponent of capital punishment, sentences Winston Mosley to die in the electric chair. When the sentence is passed, Shapiro says, I would gladly pull the switch myself. I believe that by Winston Mosley's criminal activities and conduct, he was a person who was evil, totally and completely evil, and not deserving to walk in society again, and that society would be better off if he did not live. The victory for the prosecution is short-lived. The defense appeals, claiming that the judge made a mistake in the sentencing phase of the trial. You were supposed to give the lawyer, defense lawyer, the opportunity to show things that tended to make him less of a horror and more of a person who, because of circumstances and background and everything else, was unaware and oblivious to those normal things which make a person a human being. He wasn't a human being, and Shapiro, the judge, stopped me. He wouldn't let me do that. In 1967, the death sentence is reversed on appeal. The New York State Court of Appeals agrees with the defense, and Winston Mosley's sentence is changed to life in prison. Although the legal system was finished with the case, there are still lingering questions about the behavior of the witnesses. Up until uh, Miss Genevieve's death in 1964, psychologists had never studied what we today call pro-social behavior. Uh, it was clear that nobody, behavioral scientists and others, had any idea why the citizens did not come to Miss Genevieve's aid. The Genevieve's murder instigates hundreds of studies about social psychology. The most famous assessment of what makes us tick appears in 1968. A study by psychologists John Darley and Bib Latain explains the Genovese murder with a new, very clinical term, diffusion of responsibility. In essence, the study concludes that the greater the number of bystanders, the less likely each is to act. People may not take it upon themselves to do something, even if they think it is an emergency. And this is a powerful factor. In the case of Miss Genovese, each person may have felt it was somebody else's obligation at three in the morning to do something. The studies of the Genovese case give social psychologists and behaviorists reason to be concerned about the future. Her case exposed what, what I call the secret of street crime, that criminals rely on citizens not to do anything, even when citizens are there. It's almost as if the bystanders are knowing accomplices of the criminal. There is something about that existential fact that uh, makes this case so haunting. In the years immediately following her murder, Kitty Genovese becomes a national symbol, a challenge to our own apathy. But her brother, William, is still haunted by the silence of the 38 witnesses. He wonders what he would have done. Well, I was obsessed with doing what the right moral thing was as I, as I perceived it. Vietnam becomes his proving ground. He enlists in the Marines, but fights on two fronts, the one in Vietnam and the one in his mind, the urban battlefield of his sister's murder. I was always there. It was that perspective, looking down into the dark, what's going on? Well, what's going on is a fellow human being needs help. In Vietnam, William Genovese courageously precedes American troops through a free fire zone littered with landmines. Concerned for the safety of his fellow soldiers, he attempts to disable one of the mines. So I grabbed it and I'm thinking, God damn it, I bet there's a com boom. The force of the blast rips off both his legs at the hip. It is March 13th, 1967 the third anniversary of his sister's murder. William Genovese returns home a decorated war hero. 
It takes 27 years before William can bring himself to visit the scene of his sister's murder in Kew Gardens. He rolls his wheelchair past the streetlight on Austin Street and stops at the bottom of the stairwell where a neighbor watched a man kill his sister. I hit the pits of rage. It's like I would have literally flown, and I was athletic. I would have flown down those foot into the face. I mean, I was imagining all this stuff to save the day at the end and thinking, oh no, at that time she probably would have died anyway, or, you know, and it just got to be, that's a fantasy. I mean, it's, it's gone, you know, it's gone. In that moment, he buries the lingering demons of the 38 witnesses, but he believes he knows what Kitty Genovese would have done if she heard the cries of a stranger. Well, there's a cerebral part of me that says, well, I have to be, uh, you know, balanced about this. And she was a human being. She lived in the city. She would have known. But push that aside, and it's like pff, she'd be there in a minute. She always stood up. She always stood up. You know, she would, you know, she would, she would stand up for what, was, what she thought was right. 35 years after Kitty Genovese's murder, only three states, Vermont, Minnesota, and Wisconsin, have laws that make it a crime to turn your back on a person in mortal danger. The laws, often called Good Samaritan laws, call upon the moral duty of citizens to alert authorities when someone is in peril. The lesson of the Good Samaritan parable is that regardless of how you feel about the victim, based on class or creed or race or religion, they are a person and you should extend to them acts of kindness and mercy and basic human decency. Attorney Jeffrey Dion advocates a duty to assist, making it a legal requirement to report a crime. What we're talking about is the easy and painless rescue, picking up the phone and calling 911. It's not hard to do, and everyone should do it. And, and I always promised myself that I would not do what those neighbors did. I think I certainly owed it to Kitty Genovese. I have to learn something from it. I must learn something from what happened to her. A human life is worth, at the very least, a telephone call. It's worth a lot more, but at the very least, a telephone call. But many feel they have the right to mind their own business. Is it government's responsibility to require people to help one another? Should government be in the business of coercing kindness? I think the answer to that question is yes, when the cost of that kindness is small and the damage from not acting is so great. Individual liberty is one thing, but the United States was also founded on community values. Uh, an obligation that citizens have to one another. But the right not to intervene continues to take a human toll. A woman is gang raped in a bar in Massachusetts while scores of bar patrons watch and no one calls the police. A taxi driver in Denver is murdered and his body is stuffed in the trunk of his cab. Scores of people are watching from their apartments. No one calls the police. A seven-year-old girl is murdered in a casino in Nevada. And a friend watched the assault take place and never alerted security. Despite moral outrage following high-profile cases, there are still many silent witnesses and anonymous victims. In 1999, A.M. Rosenthal still thinks about Kitty Genovese and the larger implications of her murder. What makes the story, as far as God is concerned, is it the number? Is one murder not astonishing? One witness not astonishing, while 38 is? Does God operate on a head count? How many people knew what was going on, let's say, in Auschwitz? Does he count them? They didn't do anything. And for the man who helps break the news about the silent witnesses in 1964, there are still questions about who and what we are questions that do not have easy answers. Suppose I didn't hear the screaming, but knew that something terrible was taking place. I just knew it. Was that my business? Suppose you know that a thousand miles away, hundreds or thousands of people were being murdered. 
and you didn't do anything about it. How far away do you have to be from a murder in order to get absolution for doing nothing? That was the final question that I've asked myself. Is it around the corner? Is it a block away? Is it a thousand miles away? How far are you expected to extend the compassion in you? And of course the answer is, it is limitless. Yeah, I had to prove that I wasn't going to be like the 38 that night, even though I forgive them, you know. And Mosley, I mean, what can you say about Mosley? What was his life like? What was he raised like? What, what genes does he have? Where's our responsibility anyway? So you tell me the answer to that question. We're all searching for it. Humanity has been searching for the answer to that forever. In 1977, Winston Mosley wrote an opinion piece in the New York Times entitled, Today I am a man who is an asset to society. In the commentary, he said he'd been reformed and should be released. Parole for Mosley has been repeatedly turned down, and in 1995, Mosley's request for a new trial was also denied. I'm Arthur Kent for the History Channel. Thanks for watching. Discover more about this and every History's Mysteries topic at HistoryChannel.com.